Thank you. Okay, so my title is Andrea Tirios. F, which I will define later, and uh, see things hot into us. <coughs> okay, so I will a bit try to tell you what I mean by real zeros, but I will start by saying what I mean by this F here. So we get F, yeah. Homomorphic Hecke cusp form of even weight k and for the full modular group. Gamma. And I should say that for this talk, it's not very important to know much about. These things I will tell you everything you need to know about homomorphic cusp forms on the way. And the, I guess the first thing I want to say is that they are very important, so it's interesting to know about their properties and stuff like that. And the second thing is that they are periodic in some sense, so this picture is probably very familiar that we have this kind of fundamental domain here, where here we have minus half and plus half. And uh, this is the upper half plane, call it H. And here we have the fundamental domain, which we call X. And it's H over gamma. And uh, by modularity, it's enough to study the cusp form in this fundamental domain. And it kind of, the values here determine the values everywhere else. So we just have to care about this fundamental domain here. And so we are interested in the zeros of the cusp form. So we write ZF for the Z of the zeros. So it's so those complex numbers in the fundamental domain for which f z is zero. And uh, what we know about this is at the first that it's finite and uh, it has size k over 12 by so called valence formula plus a constant. And the uh, other thing is by the quantum unique egoticity, which was proved by Holowinski and Sander and recently, we know that the zeros are equally distributed in the fundamental domain. And what I mean by them being equally distributed is that if we take any nice subset of the fundamental domain, then the number of zeros in that subset divided by the number of all zeros is the same as the hyperbolic area of that nice subset divided by the hyperbolic area of everything. So we kind of know some global properties of this, but then the question remains, what can we say about final distribution of the zeros in this area? And if we look at pictures about the zeros, there are some things that are apparent first, they are symmetric with respect to this axis, which is not difficult to show at all. And the second thing is that it seems that there are quite many zeros on these lines here, and there are some here. So that's a phenomenon that, that Gauss and Sarnak went to explore, that why is this so? And uh, we are calling the zeros of this line delta 1, and call this line delta 2, and this line delta 3. And uh, we got zeros in this delta line. Here. 
and the reason for calling them real is that the cusp form takes real values on these lines delta 1 and delta 2. And uh, if we multiply the form by its set to k over 2, then it takes real values on delta 3. So that it's quite a, almost real values on these lines. So that already explains that it's more likely that it gets zeros on these lines because it's the imaginary part is automatically zero. You don't have to care about it. You just have to get the real part to be zero in order to find a zero of the form. And so the, what do we know about these zeros? Are there? It looks like there are lots of them, but how many are there? And that's what Kos and Sanak studied recently. So if we consider the set of red zeros in delta 1, you know, and delta 2, I should say that we can't say anything about the zeros in delta 3, except in, in the case of Eisenstein series, all the zeros are on the line delta 3. But in the case of cusp forms, we don't know where they are or what happens on the line delta 3. So what Goss and Sarnak were able to solve was that there are in, indeed infinitely zeros on this union of delta 1 and delta 2. And they got that there are at least k to 1 quarter minus 1 over 80 minus epsilon zeros there. And they also showed that if one assumes the Riemann hypothesis, you can get rid of the 1 over 80. So this is goes certainly to infinity with k, but it's not still a very big proportion of all the zeros. And what is expected to hold is that there are about k to half times log k. They are expected asymptotics, so that's the conjecture that Gross and Sanak made <coughs> about this. And uh, then what I was able to prove was that you don't need the Riemann hypothesis here, that you can get rid of the 1 over 80 without using the Riemann hypothesis. Of course, this looks like this is still far away from this expected one, but there are very good reasons why this is difficult to get, and why this is the barrier of the methods is k to 1 over 4. And then other thing I was able to show was that we get this, something like this expected lower bound for almost all forms. So say for 100% of forms when k tends to infinity. So there are about k over 12 forms of weight k. And uh, I saw that there are at, least at most k to 1 minus eta exceptional forms for which we don't get this lower bound. So this tells us about the union of the two lines, delta 1 and delta 2. But it doesn't still tell us if there are infinitely many zeros on delta 1 or if there are infinitely many zeros on delta 2. But Gross and Sarnak showed also that this is true. So for i equal 1 or 2, we have that this ZF union intersect will just one of the lines has size at least log k. So the point is that it tends to infinity with k. And then doing a bit of tricks, one can get a polynomial lower bound here. And what I managed to get is 1 over 300, which is not, of course, not a very big exponent. But there are, again, there are good reasons why it's difficult to get anything better than something like this. And also here, the concept is that we get k to half log k. So there are some constants for which this is supposed to be asymptotic to this. So I guess the next question is how to solve these things or how to approach the problem. 
So what, what one does is we take the Fourier expansion of f which has this form. So it's a cusp form, so we start from 1 and then we have the Hecke eigenvalues lambda f n and the normalizing factor n to k minus 1 over 2 and e n z. And uh, what Goss and Sarnak did was that they showed that there is a single term which dominates here for certain values of y. So if we, we can write this as e if z is alpha plus i y, this is e alpha n times e to minus 2 p y. So the point is that if n is small, then this thing is small compared to large n's. And if n is big, then this thing is small compared to large n's. So you just have to find out what is the n value for which this gets the domination. And what they thought was that if we take an L, which is between some constant c1 and so c times times k to half over log k and uh, take y to be, I believe it's 4p over k, k minus 1 over 4p l, then this thing gets dominated by the l Fourier coefficient. term of size k to minus delta, which is small when k is large. So it's exactly this times something positive, where this something positive is essentially what you get from here and here. But we don't have to care about it, because we are only interested in the zeros of this thing, so something positive doesn't matter for us. And now we are in a place where hopefully a calculus student could find zeros of this. We just have to find positive and negative values for this and then note that by Bolzano's theorem there are zeros in between. So if L1 and L2 are such that this lambda F L1 E L1 alpha is at most some negative fixed epsilon prime. And on the other hand, the thing for L2 is at least this fixed epsilon prime 2. Then there must be a zero between YL1 and YL2. So zero in the zero set such that it's in the interval. Of course, it might be that y l1 is smaller than larger than y l2, but it doesn't matter. The point is that there is a zero between y l1 and y l2. Uh, for either of them, yeah. But yeah, alpha. one of them so that this is real and it makes sense here. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so this, if we can find such else, then we can find one zero. But of course, we wanted lots of zeros rather than just one. So we have to find lots of pairs L1 and L2 such that this holds. And such that all the L1s are not on the left and all the L2s are not on the right. And then we get the same zero between every one of them. But this can be handled by requiring that we find those pairs of L's in short intervals. So 
So if for some theta, we can find L1 and L2 from the interval x to x plus x to the theta. You might point out Henry's question. If yes. the number's odd, then at least one of them has to be on the, one of these lines. So I mean, the other one, how are you counting the zeros? You're doing Boucher, or are you moving up and down each line separately? Ah, uh, I'm moving up and down each line separately. Right, okay. Yeah. Well, then you have to argue why. To me, it was always easier to point out that in this interval, Yes. If that number's yeah. odd, then they have to yeah. be on one of the two lines. Actually. Yeah, well. It doesn't tell you which line. Yeah, yeah well, I'm using the same alpha in both. <laughs> and so it's, yeah, but it's true, thanks. So if for some theta we can find L1 and L2 in these short intervals, where x is around x, and it was supposed to be k over half over log k. And if we can do this for for almost all x, for all positive proportion of x, this axis. This means that we can find x to 1 minus theta, which is about k to 1 minus theta over two zeros in this theta 1 union, that's 2. So we have changed a statement about zeros of uh, cusp form to a statement about its Fourier coefficients in short intervals. And uh, I'm mostly interested in the first theorem here. And in that case, you can argue by a bit like what Peter said, or by using parity that. That actually, if for again for almost, oh, if for more than more than half of these possible axes, we can find. L in this short interval such that uh, just the absolute value of lambda FL is at least epsilon prime. Then we get this x to 1 minus theta real zeros. So I, I, I won't prove this, but it's not difficult to see that this is so, so what we have lost here is that now we need more than half of the axis to be good rather than just a positive proportion. But what we have won is that we don't have to care about the sign anymore. We just have to find an absolute value which is bounded away from zero. And in order to do this, we of course need some information about this Hecke eigenvalues. And the point is that they are Hecke so that we have the Hecke relation, which implies nice things about them. So the two properties that we are going to use. Yeah. So. What he's saying is everything is dependent on the Hecke the Hecke eigenform. Otherwise, yes. the zeros are one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So what we. Uh, it will, 
it is easier to find these things because the first negative eigenvalue is quite far away. So it's like k to 0.496. Uh, yeah, I didn't explain it, so <laughs> you didn't miss anything. But the point is that if you just look at one of the lines, you can use even and odd numbers. So actually, we need that the L is odd. Odd because you can look at 2L and perhaps 4L. The one of these is such that the Hecke eigenvalue is large. And uh, by that, you can kind of play with the lines but well, I don't, it's it's not difficult, but yeah, to get it because on the one of the lines, even numbers give you minus one to the, or you get from e alpha l, you get minus one to k, and in the other line you get one, so you get negative and positive things from taking even and odd values. Okay, so the facts that they need about the eigenvalues are that they are multiplicative. And the special case of the Hickey relation that lambda f b squared is lambda f b squared minus 1. And uh, what is the use of this is that both of these can't be small. One of them has to have large absolute value. This is a trick that was first used by Ivanet and Sanak. So what we get is that if we write bj to be the set of primes such that lambda f b to j has absolute value at least, 1 over 5, say, could use code and tracer here or something like that. Then P1 union P2 is the set of all primes. So just by this, both of them can't be well, smaller than 1 over 5 because otherwise it couldn't hold. And uh, now the point of this is that, well, for all primes either lambda fp or lambda fp squared is large, and we can use results on primes in short intervals. So what we know is that if we take the interval from x to half to x to half plus x to 1 over 40, There are primes in this interval. For almost all x. So this is a result of yeah. And now by this there must be either in P1 or P2. So if okay, maybe it's better to call them P and Q to not to get confused with P. And Q. 1 and p2 here. So we have two primes from such a very short interval. And if both of them are from the set p1, we take l to be the product of those, those two primes. And so this product belongs to the interval x to x plus, say, 3 times x to half plus 1 over 40. And uh, lambda f l is by multiplicativity at least 1 over 25, which is at least epsilon prime. If you take epsilon prime, to be 1 over 25. So in this case, we can find series numbers L from short intervals of length with theta half plus 1 over 40. And if this is not the case, then certainly 
p must be on p2 and we can take L to be so P Q. Trying to say here. So we can take our L to be P squared, and it again belongs to this same interval as P belongs to this interval, and lambda f L has absolute value at least one over five by definition of the set P two. So this concludes that this interval, almost all these intervals contain no numbers L, so that by plugging it in to my claim here that we get then x to 1 minus theta zeros, we have proved this thing here. And uh, also, it's known that this very short intervals x to half to x to half plus x to epsilon contain primes for almost all x if we assume the Riemann hypothesis. So this also proves this case from here. Yes. <laughs> okay. But then the next thing is how do we get something like this unconditionally without proving that so the interval contains primes. And the way to do it is that here we just use primes or products of two primes, but we could use products of more than two primes. So right. N i to be a set of integers n that contain prime factors only from set B i. And by definition, if we take lambda f n to j for n from n j, then this Hecke eigenvalue is by multiplicativity at least 1 over 5 to the number of prime factors of n. And, well, we need that n is square free as well. Now, if the number of prime factors is bounded, then this number is bounded here, and we get what we want. And uh, it's not difficult to get the number of prime factors to be bounded, so I will forget about it from now on. And I will forget about the square freeness from now on, because they, are, they just make things more complicated. So I just forget about this and forget about that, and just want to show that these things contain stuff in short intervals or in almost all short intervals. So we can use these ni's in the place of bi's before. So if we can show that the interval x to half x to half plus x to the epsilon contains let's say m and n from the union of these two things. Notice that the union is not now all the integers, it's just the integers because this contains only prime factors from p1 and this contains only prime factors from t2. p2. There are lots of integers that contain prime factors from both of them. So if we can show that this is true for more than half of x, we can do as above. So if m and n are both from n1, we take l to be the product. And again, it's in a nice short interval, and it has 
uh, Roche's eigenvalue and if m is from n to take l equal to m squared. And <coughs> again, it's from the nice interval and it has a nice Roche's eigenvalue as soon as we forget about the number of prime factors and stuff. But then, I guess the big question is that are there such numbers m and n here and in the short interval? And this is what we have to kind of issue. This is the issue now, and this is getting farther and farther away from the cusp forms and turning to a sieving program. So what we really have here is that if I use notation so for set C of reals and X and Y Real numbers C, X, Y for the intersection of set C with the interval from X to Y. Then what we want is that we have this set of primes, which will be P1 or P2 in our case. And we have this set n, which is generated from by primes in this set p. And we want to show that proportion rather than half of these sets n in short interval so I use my new notation are non empty. So this is what we want. Or we we want a couple of numbers from here, but anyway it's as easy to show that it's non empty than to show that there are a few of them there. Actually we want to expected amount almost, but anyway, I will just restrict to the case of showing that it's non-empty. So now at this point, this has, hasn't anything to do with cusp forms anymore. This is a question about sieving. We have this set of primes and we want to sieve all the multiples of primes from P complement. And this is kind of a very general sieving problem in short intervals because we don't know much about the set of primes by which we want to sieve. But what is important here and what we know in our case is that P1 union P2 is the set of all primes and we can sieve either by P1 or by P2. So both of them can't be very large basically. So we divide into two cases. So case one is that we have an interval i where well, let's say it's a subset of x to eta to x to epsilon, don't have to care much about that, such that the, this set p from which we are generating stuff contains more than half of primes in that interval. Okay, I could use my notation here, I guess. So P in this interval has cardinality, which is more than half of the cardinality of the set of all primes in this interval. And 
and then case two is that this doesn't hold. So for all intervals, and when I'm talking about existing interval or, or it, all intervals, I assume that the interval is not kind of of length two or something like that, but it's just a reasonable length. So we get that for all intervals, we have almost half of the primes. So this set P contains at least half minus delta of all the primes in the interval. And now if we remember that the union of these sets P1 and P2 was the set of all primes. We have that either there is an interval for which P2 contains at least half of the primes. Or if there isn't an interval for which this P2 contains at least half of the primes, then this P1 must contain almost half of the primes in all intervals. So we end up with this sieving problem and we have to show in these two cases that our claim that these short intervals or more than half of the short intervals are non-empty in the set N. Okay, so let's start with the case one. We, in both cases we take a certain subset of N for which we can so that it's non-empty. So we take in this case A to be the set of products P1, P2 times N, where this P1 and P2 belong to this interval. There, are, there is lots of stuff, or more than half of the stuff, and N belongs to a set n prime, which is a certain very nicely behaving subset of n. It's very regular and it's possible to choose such n prime, but we don't have to care about it really. Then we consider this in short intervals. So we can write it in the form where they take this thing from the interval and we take P1 as before. But we take let P2 to be any prime from this interval and take N to be from N prime. And then remove the things where P2 is from P complement. So this is just a trivial identity. I haven't done anything but just written this P in the form of set of all primes minus P complement. But we are interested in the lower bounds, so I can change this equality into lower bound, no problem. And uh, then I can make this a bit larger by instead of taking P1 from the set P to take it from the set of all primes. So it just makes things larger. And now we have two terms here which look very similar. The only difference is in both cases we have this n in n prime and in both cases we have a prime which is in from the set of all primes. Here it's p1 and here it's p2 but don't care about that. 
but here we have p1 from this set p and we are, here we have p2 from this set p complement and remember that this set p was more than half of the things so this p complement is less than half of the things so one would expect that this is larger than this and it's possible to taking these things from certain ranges and stuff it's possible to show an asymptotic formula for both of these things by Perron's formula and the mean values of Dirichlet polynomials. That's what's usually done when proving things on short intervals on primes. And the point that one can do it is that there we have a set of all primes appearing so that we get Riemann set of function appearing so that we can use the zero free region in order to get the asymptotic formula. But anyway, this ends up being something like one plus delta, half plus delta, which was the density of this set P minus half minus delta, which is the density of set P complement times something positive, which comes from everything else. And this is positive as we wanted. So in this first case, this kind of a trivial trick leads to success and we get what we wanted in that case. Yes. Yeah, it's it's. Yes. Well, it need, it's needed also for the statement for us to have the a a subset of n, which is the set of things generated from this p. But anyway, it's just just there to get the primes into right ranges in order to use those. Sorry? Then we are in the case two, which I'm next going into. So the trouble is that this argument doesn't work in that case. So that's why I have to devise another argument for that case. But because it's just enough to have one interval for, for which this, we have density at least half. So in the other case, we have all the intervals having the same density around half, so it makes things easier. And in this case too, the thing that's only more difficult is this set P is smaller, so we can replace this inequality here by equality. And now we can use classical half plus delta dimensional sieve in order to handle this. But again, we have to be careful with the ranges. So we have to get certain set A, which is product of MNs, where this N is again in the N prime, which is a certain nicely behaving subset of N. And then this M is from certain range, say eta 1 to x to eta 2. Just have to cook up things that are in nice ranges and such that if P divides M, then P belongs to this P. And actually at the end of the day, we want it even to be of size at least something very, very small, let's say epsilon prime. And that is to ensure that we don't have too many prime factors. But anyway, just don't care. And now, as I said, what we do is we receive this. 
and the arithmetic information for the sieve comes from the same mean value theorems as in this case. Now we have a free variable we are considering about the sizes of AD in the sieve. And for the, that free variable plays the role of the prime numbers. So we can use uh, half plus delta dimensional heap sieve here. But in such a C, we can't get a lower bound. We get an upper bound for the number of things. So what we get is that a y to y plus y to epsilon has size at most some alpha times a times y to epsilon. Well, this A contains everything it contains, the over, over log Y and stuff like that. But anyway, we get an upper bound of this sort for the in short intervals just by using the half past delta dimensional heap here. But what can we, we can also do is we can study this set A in long intervals. So if we take a long interval fr yeah, this, well, I can write it down, but this A was supposed to contain the logarithm. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So if we consider the long interval, things are, of course, much easier because now we have a long interval rather than this terribly short, <coughs> short interval. And here we can use sums of multiplicative functions in order to get a good lower bound for A or almost asymptotics, I guess. So what we get is that this is beta times this same thing here. Again, the length of the interval. Well, let's divide by log y, as we did over there. But anyway, we get a lower bound of this sort. And putting these together means that there can't be too many empty short intervals, because short intervals contain only a certain amount of stuff. So what we get is that proportion beta over alpha of these things must be non-empty. Just by combining this. And what we wanted was that proportion larger than half of these things are non-empty, but unfortunately the trouble is that this bit of alpha is never going to be half. This is related to very different on I guess. But taking the delta here small enough so that we are using a half plus delta dimensional with very, very small delta, we can take this as close to one half as we want. So let's say that we can take beta over alpha to be point 49, which is quite close to what we want. Uh, epsilon is fixed, yes. Yes. And uh, you can only see that to the y to epsilon for this log. I can't say this is log y to epsilon. But the upper bound you mean by, by something like 1 over the square root of epsilon is bad. I Uh, 
unless you're shocking the body, it's not very shocking. Right, the, the arithmetic information you, you use for saving these hot intervals come from the mean value theorems here, and there you can. Oh, this is not for everybody. Uh, no, it's for almost everybody. Okay. okay, sorry, sorry, I didn't say that. Okay. Yeah, okay. but for everybody, you can use a trivial upper bound here to get the conclusion. Yeah, so this is for almost all y. Yeah, sorry about not saying that. So the last task is risk cool or get saved from this problem that they are just below one over half and get just above one over half. So what we have is that 49% of, let's go back to our notation about x to half. and on empty. But remember that we are considering the case of P1 here. I say that we have that either P2 satisfies 1 or P1 satisfies 2. So we are in the case of having P1. And in the case of P1, we were multiplying two things together from this interval. We were taking L equal to Mn and things like that. So what we want is that more than 50%, say, say 51% of these longer intervals where we have multiplied things are non-empty. And by now we have been taking Two, three, two things from here and then multiplying them together to get something from here. But we have plenty of these different intervals and we could take things from two different intervals and multiply them together in order to get something from here. So now if we have ni from xi to half, xi to half plus, let's say x to epsilon, then n1 times n2 belongs to n x1, x2 to half, x1, x2 to half, plus something like x to half plus epsilon. And if this x1, x2 to the half is such that our original x to half, x to half, x to half plus epsilon was empty, we get a new interval in this case of these longer intervals by multiplying these two different things together. And the last thing to do is to show that this actually happens, that there must be these things that we get kind of new intervals by multiplying these things together. We don't have to get many new intervals because we just want to win like 2% or epsilon percent if you want. And the way to do this is to first, well, let's name these intervals. Consider ii, which is the interval from x to half plus i times x to epsilon to x to half plus i plus 1 x to epsilon, or let's say j where this j is at most capital C, say x to half 
minus epsilon. And we consider the set of j such that this interval is nice such that it contains things from n. So we get a to be the set of j such that n in this interval i j is non empty. And by this fact, where we have to make the intervals a bit longer to get the overlapping things right, but essentially we get that this cardinality of this set of good j's is at least 0.49 times capital J. Because 49% of the intervals were supposed to be good. And then Consider set A plus A, by this I mean the set of J1 plus J2 there. So yeah, so up from A. Now if we have some K from this A plus A set, it means that if we multiply the corresponding intervals with J1 and J2 together, we get that an interval of the form of this form must be non-empty. Just by multiplying the corresponding things from this sort of intervals. And notice that because A contains things that are at most J, the A plus A contains things that are at most 2J. So we get this thing that we wanted in the case there are lots of good Ks here. So if now this A plus A has cardinality at least this 0.51 times the length, the potential length of this a plus a, which is 2j. We are done. Because then 51% 50, 50, of these intervals are good, and that's more than 50, and that's what we wanted. And on the other hand, if this is not the case, then by putting in the lower bound for A here, we get that this is at most something 0 0.51, 0 0.49 times 2 times the cardinality of A, where we can say that this thing here is say 2.1, I guess. And uh, in this case, we, ha we go into additive combinatorics. We have this Freiman's theorem, which says that if we have such a set A, which has small doubling, meaning that A plus A is not much larger than what it must be, it must be at least twice A by an easy argument. So if it has only small doubling, then by this Freiman's 3k minus 3 theorem, as it's called, A is contained in a short arithmetic progression. And this means that A is very regular. It's something like This, it might have a bit of gaps because it's just contained in the sort AP. But anyway, there is lots of things, it's, and it has, uh, it's evenly spaced 
and uh, well, I don't have time to explain it very much, but what happens is that if we just put a constant here, say five times this, when we get non-empty stuff, thanks to this thing that this A is very nicely distributed, and well, we don't get it for all x in this same x to 2x, but in the bit shorter interval. But anyway, we do get, we do gain the from 0.49 to 0.451 by this Kramer's theorem, and we get this a plus a. Uh, well, it must be less than 3 over 2 or something like that. So there's lots of space. Yeah, the A plus A is not, it's almost just a little bit bigger than A in this very structure. Yes. Uh, well, as long as it's smaller than two and a half or something like that, then it's fine. Uh, uh, well, three, but even three, I had to actually use a quantitative version, which is weaker than the Kramer's theorem, but I don't say about it. So this just gets us one non-empty thing. But in order to get rid of this, not having too many prime factors and being square free, we need a quantitative version of these things. But I have been working on a bit similar problem on long intervals with Andrew Cranville and Dimitris Kogolopoulos, and we have shown a quantitative version of the Kramer's theorem in that work. So it gives us what we need. And even so combining this one and two, we get this done. And for this, I should say that in the, for almost all forms, we are always in case one, which makes things much easier. And that's why we get the, this from it. We don't have to go to the case two, and we don't have to take squares of things. We can just do it for almost all, all things by large inequality. And for this, we have the problem I mentioned earlier, that the first negative eigenvalue is that we, we can prove only that it's something like k to 0.496 or something like that. So half minus this is 1 over 300 or something like that. So that's the reasoning why one can't get better than this. And for why we, we can't get, why we are stuck with 1 over 4 rather than half is this, that we might have that they set p2, which was the, or they set p1, which was the lambda f p that the had at least size epsilon prime, it might be that this is essentially non-empty. Oh, sorry, essentially empty, which means that we have to use the set P2, and then we have to square things, and that loses us one square. So if we could show, show that this can't be always around zero, then we would get the half here. But the trouble is that we are playing with primes that are very sm rather small compared to the weight of the form, so it's difficult to say much about them. So that's. Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah, because in that case you get. That's why she's got k to the half and not k to the quarter. Yes, yeah, because in that case you get that this is at least one over five for more than half of the primes, and then you can use the case one directly, and you are not in the trouble. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think one has to lose epsilon. I think it's enough to lose something a bit less, but you, you lose something, I guess. Anyway. Okay, so I think I have shown this one as well. And well, it implies this one. So I finished the conjectures are not shown, but I don't know how to do this, so I can't do it. Thank you.